Have you ever felt overwhelmed with all that's going on in the world? Sometimes we don't realize that we can make a difference. My name is Debbie Van Grieken, and it is my hope to inspire you to take small steps towards social impact. Join us each week as we have conversations with those who have taken simple steps towards living a more sustainable and socially conscious lifestyle. If you want to make social impact, let's start small. The Small Steps Podcast is proudly sponsored by Moya Shea Products. As a listener, enjoy 15% off your online purchase. Use code SMALLSTEPS15 at checkout. At Moya, we believe in people helping people. Supporting the local and global communities that help our organization succeed is very important to us. We apply a fair trade framework when purchasing raw materials, supporting farmers and families. Thinking global and acting local, Moya works with organizations to better the lives of children through education and fair trade. Are you looking for the best moisturizer for beautiful, healthy, glowing skin? Our Shea products are superb moisturizers and have exceptional healing properties for those suffering from skin issues. Check out these products and our wellness line at moyasheabutter.com. Welcome back to the Start Small podcast. I'm your host, Debbie Van Grieken, and today I'm pleased to be joined by Ashley Moore. Ashley is a fourth generation generation woodworker, early childhood educator, mom, wife, and homesteader. She enjoys living the simple life and finds joy in the small things. She is the daughter of a full-time cabinet maker and the wife of a tool manufacturer. She is a work-from-home mom with a three-year-old, and she homeschools with a Montessori approach. When she's not in the wood shop, she enjoys spending long days in her garden, getting her hands dirty, and being with her chickens. As a specialized early childhood educator, she uses her knowledge to educate other moms in different play-based learning methods, toy rotations, and maintaining a simple, clutter-free environment for exploration. In her shop, she sells toys that encourage play-based learning, emotional education, and practice life skills with Montessori-inspired toys, all while maintaining an aesthetically pleasing environment for moms. She uses natural, locally sourced materials to create her projects and uses only recycled packaging with a strong focus on zero waste with her materials. We're so happy to have you with us, Ashley. Oh, thank you, Debbie. I'm super excited to do this. That's awesome. I just feel like there's just so much to talk to you about. There's like (laughs) so many topics and I can't believe all the things that you're doing. It's just wonderful. But you mentioned in your bio that you're a fourth generation woodworker. So did you always want to have a career in woodworking? Absolutely not. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I grew up, had to work for my dad in my preteen and teenage years in the summer when I wasn't in school. So I got a job like as soon as I was legally allowed to get a job just so I could stop running the table saw <laughs> and sand. That's hilarious. Uh, then I went to school for early childhood education and I really like that. I had a couple extra courses so I'm a little bit more specialized than your average ECE and then I met Ethan who is a tool salesman and manufacturer so kind of hard to ignore all the signs <laughs> yeah. when I was looking at that trying to figure out like what can I do to work from home and make money. I have all the tools I could ever need or want at my disposal and knowledge. So I find it interesting, like you must be like one of a few, especially local woodworkers being female. Did you find any challenges being in this industry? It's typically more of a male dominated industry. Yes, it is. I mean, I grew up going to job sites with my dad. So I kind of learned how thicker skin there and how to talk the male lingo. But especially at big box stores, you face a lot of sexism. A lot of the employees asking me like, oh, Oh, can uh, can I help you find your husband? Did your husband send you with a list? Like, does what? your husband need help? And I'm I'm there solo, or I'm there with Anderson on my hip. Like, no, right? <laughs> and I don't know if you watch Parks and Rec, but there's a scene in that show, and it's really funny. Ron Swanson, one of the main characters, he's the woodworker in real life, but he walks into the hardware store, and the teenage employee says, "Can I help you find something?" And he just looks at him and says. I know more than you. It keeps going. (laughs) And that's basically the attitude that I walk into the hardware store with now. Which is, you pretty much have to, right? Like it's- Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to walk in there with your confidence. That's for sure. You know, you're a busy mom. You run your own business. And you homestead, which I love. I just want to know, what would your perfect day look like? 
Oh gosh. Okay. Well, it's probably warmer. That's for sure. Like June, late June, oh, early July. <laughs> that is like my favorite time. I start most days first thing out in the chicken coop, making sure everybody's good there. I would play with Anderson outside in the afternoon when the sun's beaten down hot. I'd come inside and that's when we'd work and Anderson could play. And then probably dinner out on the patio and gardening in the evening. That would be the ultimate day for me. So I follow you on Instagram. And so all of our the followers would know that your days do not typically go that well. What does a typical day for Ashley look like? <laughs> well, farm chores must go on. So I start every morning out in the coop. I'm usually in my pajamas and my house coat and some big old rubber boots. It's not pretty. It smells a little funny. Definitely a lifestyle that I love, but requires some adjustment if you've never done it before. I have a three-year-old and I work from home. So my house is never clean, I feel like, at all. And I'm very clumsy, so I usually fall and hurt myself at some point. (laughs) Every surface of my house is usually covered with an order. Anderson colors on the boxes so I can keep them occupied. We call that custom packaging. That's awesome. (laughs) Well, thanks for keeping it real. I actually have loved the orders that I have purchased from you. I've bought Uh, some of your wooden toys for my grandchildren. And at Start Small, we're all about lowering our plastic consumption, trying to live a more sustainable lifestyle. You make such beautiful wooden toys. Can you share with us why these toys might be a little bit better than their plastic counterparts and how they're maybe a little bit better for the environment? Yes. Well, thank you for purchasing. That's awesome. Really appreciate that. I think the main thing for me is safety. So like plastic toys are usually made with harmful chemicals where wood and the majority of what I use is maple is naturally antibacterial. So you don't, you know, when a baby's putting a block in its mouth and it's plastic, you don't know where that came from. And it's actually like the newer plastic. Any of my plastic toys I have are from the 70s and they're vintage and they're passed down to me and I love them. So, you know, I, I do think that there is a place and time for plastic, but wood will always have my heart. Plastic toys tend to break easier, whereas wood toys have some longevity so you can pass them down, which is, you know, better for the environment in more ways than one. Why not have heirloom toys that you can keep around, right? Plastic toys light up. Boy, do they make sound. That is so true. As a mom of five, I remember those toys. Yeah. Anderson had a walker and you know what? It did teach him how to walk, but it played this stupid song that it's like burned in my brain and it will not leave (laughs) where wooden toys are a little bit more open-ended so the child can figure out how they want to play with it and not necessarily be told how to play and they're not being overstimulated by bright, loud, different colors, just all the overstimulation that can come with the toys of today. So maybe you could share with us a little about the Montessori toy toys and why it's it seems to be really popular right now. I mean, I remember Montessori back when I was raising my kids, but it seems like it's a little bit more mainstream now. I don't know if you kind of know why or kind of talk a little bit what it is. So the Montessori approach is basically using practical real life things throughout your home, not necessarily just your playroom, using natural materials and teaching practical life skills. So, you know, outside of the playroom, Anderson has his own knife that he can use to chop vegetables. He's got a stool. So he can come up to counter height with me and cook dinner. You know, he comes out with me and we collect the eggs and we take care of the animals. In the summertime, you know, we've got our garden. In the wintertime, as far as taking care of plants, I have no shortage of houseplants. So he picks a couple that he really likes and those are kind of his. And he decides when they get watered. And sometimes that's beneficial and sometimes it's not. But, you know, he's learning the responsibility that, you know, he's in charge of it and I think this year specifically, you know, everything that parents have gone through, you know, they've had to basically be forced to homeschool and they've kind of learned that it's really hard to do like a top down approach with like the teacher being in charge and telling all the students what to learn when and how. And, you know, like today we're going to learn about the number 100 and, you know, the color purple animal, the penguin. Well, not everybody's ready to learn about that or wants to learn about that. 
and the Montessori approach is very child-led. And so I think in this past year, you've really seen a shift in parents being more child-led with their learning, which I think is great. That's exactly how I homeschool Anderson and he's only three. Montessori playrooms specifically are aesthetically pleasing. The toy room just chock full of toys. They're loud and bright. I think that that is moving to a thing of the past and parents are realizing that, you know, they can have play spaces in their living room without it looking like it's toys taking over. It's amazing. And you know, my daughter-in-law is actually, so she has two young boys and she's really implementing a lot of these as well. She's also an ECE teacher, so I can see where she gets a lot of these ideas. I'm just fascinated because I'm already seeing my 15 month old grandson doing such amazing things. I mean, he has that learning tower that you talked about that brings him up to counter level. And I'm watching him play and then cleaning up, like he's actually wiping the countertop down when he's done. I'm like, what? This is amazing. So I really love that. I'm really interested in, cause she's doing this as well. And it was kind of something I kind of did naturally with my kids a little bit, but didn't really know what I was doing. And that's toy rotation. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what toy rotation means and how it can help us create a more sustainable play routine for our kids. Yeah. So I think when people hear toy rotation, they're like, what? And so I always start with the story. And I think moms have all been there where, you know, we're doing a deep clean and we pull off the couch cushion to vacuum in there. And then the kid finds the Hot Wheels car. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's my favorite toy and where has it been and they will not put it down for three days and they they've just missed it so much so toy rotation basically works like that so the first step is to declutter I actually have a whole highlight saved on my Instagram so if you go to like at farmhouse 598 on my Instagram highlight bubbles there's one there and I kind of walk you through what my storage system looks like and it's in Anderson's closet so I took a day and I organized all of his toys into all of these buckets and I, it's difficult to explain but it's easy to explain because it's really going to depend on you know how many kids you have at home or the stage or age that your child that on a very, very busy three-year-old and that's it, just one kid. So we have, you know, about 10 toys out at a time and the rest are tucked away in his closet. And when I notice that he's getting bored, so he's not taking the toy off of the shelf at all, or he's just dumping it on the floor or he's not using it in a creative way, then I pull it and I grab something else from the closet that he might like instead. And then being child-led, I usually ask him like, hey, what do you want to learn about this week? Or, you know, is there something that you want to do? And so, you know, he told me that he wanted to learn about mushrooms and fungus. So that's what we're, we're learning about. So I pull things from his toy collection that it's like, well, okay. So like, we'll use the live edge blocks. We can talk about trees in the forest and relate that to mushrooms. So that's that's toy rotation. You, uh, you buy less which I think is like the main factor, you know, you don't need to constantly like fill these voids. And like when you're at Walmart, pick up another toy. Kids are satisfied. They know that they're going to get new toys. They know if they're bored, something else comes out. Well, and that's the, you know, thing that we've been trying to really bring awareness to is buying less, but buying quality. And I know you've got some amazing toys on your site that you created. And I know I've enjoyed them. What are your favorite toys and how do you think that they can help grow with your child and maybe last a little longer? I mean, beyond like the home decor stuff that I offer, I think right now it's probably my newest toy, which is a balance beam because I made it because Anderson liked to pretend the floor is lava. I'm sure you've heard that game. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Five boys. So... Nobody ever walked on the floor. They were on yeah. the couch and the table. And... <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's a very small to the floor balance beam, but then he took it and made a ramp. Well, then he took the bowling ball set that we have. He took the ball from it and set the bowling pins up at the end and rolled it down and knocked down the bowling pins. And then he made a ramp for his car with his rainbow tunnel at the end. And so he started with the biggest arch and moved to the smallest arch to see if he could get his car to go through. These are all things he did without Ethan or I. He figured it all out on his own. So it was really interesting to see. Really, once you remove the feet of the balance board, it's just a piece of wood. It's one of the most basic toys that you could find. And he figured out so many different ways to play with it. I think a lot of people forget when they're talking about the Montessori approach that, you know, Maria Montessori started 
her first Montessori school in the poorest area of Europe. So, you know, she didn't have a whole lot of money. It, you know, they probably play with sticks from outside. Yeah. They went and found natural materials in their environment, you know. And My dad's always um, talking about how he played with a stick in a can. <laughs> He was always talking about yeah. that. <laughs> My grandma used to tell me stories about playing baseball with a stick and then coal. Like that's, yeah. you know, you just <laughs> found toys and that's what you did. And so I think, you know, having all these beautiful wooden toys made by small companies like mine or like big companies like Grimm's, I think it's great. But like also a lot of my favorite toys in our playroom, I DIY. So like they might not be up for sale on my website, but you know, Anderson loves to play with them. It's a great segue into my next question because I was wondering if you really had some tips that you could give parents to create a learning environment that would encourage imaginative play because, you know, you're doing all of this stuff and, you know, you've talked about how you've incorporated the chores and the homesteading into your play. And so what can parents do to try to, you know, do something similar for their child? There's a lot of books out there that I would probably recommend if you're interested in the Montessori approach is called The Montessori Toddler by Simone Davies. So you can buy her book off Amazon or order it from chapters, but she actually has her whole book, kind of like an audiobook on Spotify. So you can search her up and she has her own podcast too. So there's a lot of free information on the internet. Use it, That's type it. it in. We'll definitely link that in the show notes so um, that people can uh, check that out for sure. Observing your child, like sitting back and putting your phone away and just watching them play, that is going to provide you with like so much more knowledge than what you'll realize. Don't try to play with them. Just literally Literally sit there and watch them play. And you're going to notice things like that you maybe wouldn't have if you were trying to work from home. I know it's very hard in this time right now to just watch your child, but you're going to learn a lot about them by watching them play. Some other really simple things are to declutter and buy less and buy with intention. So instead of buying a new toy every time you go out, maybe save up and buy a more expensive toy that's going to last you longer or can be like a multiple use kind of toy. You know, let the creative juices flow with that and buy secondhand. Buy as much as you can secondhand. I love Anderson Calls Value Village, the toy store. That's great. So that tells you where we get most of our toys from. Stand firm around the holidays with your in-laws. You know, if they want to buy your children a lot of things and you're working really hard to be intentional with your lifestyle, you know, ask them for a pass to the zoo or swimming lessons or soccer lessons or experience, something that they could pay for or put money aside for them for, you hear like a college fund, but that's not everybody's path. Right. So, you know, just encouraging like for future spending, yeah. <laughs> however that may look. It's amazing because as a, as a new grandma, that's already the way I've been thinking. And it's kind of the way I think my daughter-in-law would really appreciate as well, because she's, you know, very much like this as well. And so it's nice that we're on the same wavelength. Yeah. And I mean, it's super simple now, like I said, with the internet, there's so much free information, but there's also a lot of misinformation around Montessori because it's not just an aesthetically pleasing playroom, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing it wrong if that's what you're after. What do you really see as the vision or the next steps for your business? Are you working on any changes to your business? I know, you know, 2020 has kind of come and gone and really thrown us off our loop and 2021 has started off not much better. But, <laughs> you know, as you're thinking as a businesswoman and entrepreneur, what, what kind of vision do you have kind of going forward? So I have shifted my platform slightly the past year to a more educational base mm -hmm. versus a product base business and I'd really like to you know as we look forward and what like the future of our family looks like you know potentially growing our family becoming more of an educational based platform along with my physical good teaching people how to DIY or giving them some more ideas so that when you're at home with your kids maybe you could do these things together like super simple things like putting food coloring in a water bottle and bringing it outside and painting the snow all of these things that like I learned in school that to me, it's like, oh, yeah, that's easy. But I have to remember, not everybody went to to be an early childhood educator. That's right. Yeah. I bet there's a lot of parents right now going, wow, that's great. <laughs> like, I never even thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> Some of our Southern yeah. staff listeners might be going, what? No. <laughs> if you're Southern and you can throw some toys in like a Tupperware container and put some water around it in the freezer. So then like in the summer, 
now you've got like this ice block with toys in it and give them some hammers and let them like let it melt and let it be like a sensory experience to like get the toy out in 2020 there was a big shift to almost have a more self-sustaining lifestyle so when we hatched our chickens talking about you know the lifestyle that comes with this and what I really documented hatching my chickens so that like little kids could see what that experience looked like and I know quite a few moms have messaged me now and said like they convinced their significant other and they've got three hens coming now in April I think that's so awesome depending on your regulations and like the town that you're in if you're not lucky enough to live in a country like I am you know there might be some limits like only three hens that might be all you're allowed in your city, but that's a way for you to get your own eggs and three eggs a day may be enough for you. That's actually an excellent way to end off my last question for you, which you know I always like to kind of sum up or end the, the podcast with asking people kind of what their small steps have been to live a more sustainable life. And I know that you have been trying to do that with your family. So do you have any small steps or little tips that that you've been implementing with your family, besides, you know, the chickens to live a more sustainable life? Shopping secondhand, you know, buying used or donating wherever you can. I think that that's awesome. It breaks the chain of buying fast fashion or buying new gardening. So I started, this past year was the first year that I had a garden. I grew up with my grandparents having prize winning gardens. So I don't know why I waited so long. But like, even if people aren't comfortable with tilling up the ground and planting a whole acre worth of corn, you know, even one single pot with a tomato plant in it would be, I think, awesome. My whole focus for my garden last year was to be able to grow salsa. So anything I needed to make my own salsa, that's what went into my garden. Like, especially with my business, like I source all of my wood locally. I very rarely do I step into a big box store. I have a sawmill locally here in Niagara. I try to buy in bulk as much as I possibly can to reduce my trips back and forth. And my packaging with my business is 100% recyclable. And I recycle all of the incoming innards for the packages. So like the bubble wrap, the paper and the boxes and anything that I can possibly reuse to send out packages or use here at home with Anderson because he loves to stumble wrap. That is his most favorite thing recently. If I tape it to the floor, he will jump on it until it is flat as and flat. And, you know, like those are things that are very important to me. Um, and even in Anderson knows like he I remember him telling my father the last time we could get together like no papa that doesn't go in the garbage that goes in the cycling that's amazing yeah, I really appreciate all those little steps that you're taking. Um, it's something some of our listeners have joined us and these are new concepts for them and they're just learning and they love getting these tips. And I know that I've had some great feedback of people saying that these are so simple and they didn't, never really thought about them before. So now they're able to adopt those as well. So it's great. And I've just really enjoyed our time. I can't believe how quickly it went by. <laughs> I'm just so thrilled that you're taking a more educational approach to your business because I think that's so necessary and it's going to be so important for parents as they navigate this new reality. So I'm going to make sure that everything is linked, all of your information. So the best place to contact you is that through a website or is that through your Instagram? If you want to give us the information and we'll make sure we link that. For like social chatting is Instagram, definitely. So that's just at farmhouse598. Email is the best way to get a hold of me for like business stuff because I tend to slack a little bit with my social media and um, I literally use it for social aspects. So I try to try to keep those two entities separate. <laughs> I can, you know, carve out time and be the proper businesswoman I need to be when I need to put on the imaginary suit. Great. And then your website for purchasing products, we'll make sure that's up there as well. Farmhouse598.com. Well, thanks so much, Ashley. I'm wishing you all the best in the future. And I hope we can check in again soon. And uh, anything that you've got coming up and you want to share, let us know. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Debbie. Thank you for listening to Start Small. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and found a small step you can take today. Make sure you share it with a friend. And if you have not done so yet, make sure you hit the subscribe button. And if you are enjoying this podcast, consider taking a moment and leaving us an honest review in your Apple podcasting app so more people can be inspired to take small steps towards social impact.